Hello, I'm Caleb Colley, pulpit minister here at Lakeside. Thank you for joining us for this live stream. By tuning into this broadcast, you demonstrate your interest in New Testament Christianity, and we're so thankful for that. Perhaps you're considering Lakeside as a possible church home for you and your family. If so, this broadcast is for you. If you'd like to continue your study of New Testament Christianity, then join us for one of our worship services or Bible classes. Or email me at calebcolley at lakesidechurchofchrist.com. The live stream is also designed for the benefit of our members who can't be with us due to illness. We are praying for your speedy recovery and return. Please let us know if we can do anything for you. The live stream is not designed to replace God's plan for the assembly of the church. Now open your Bible and let's begin. Perhaps some of you didn't make it this morning, so I'll just take this opportunity again to introduce our speaker. Uh, Brother Ridgeway comes from Irontown, Ohio. He is uh, from the Buckeye State. He is a graduate of the West Virginia School of Preaching. He's been doing that for about 26 years, and he's going to bring us another final lesson tonight. So if you would give your attention to, to Brother Ridgeway. I'll be reading verses 17 through 25. It's Luke 15, 17, 17 through 25. <clears throat> but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in, in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For, my, for this is my son, which was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that reading. Appreciate that. We had a great afternoon. We uh, are so grateful to everyone and their, their great and kind comments this afternoon. Got to meet some of you this afternoon at 2.30 and got to talk with some of the deacons this afternoon. And that was enjoyable. And... Um, we got to go to uh, one of your young people. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I don't want to embarrass Michaela uh, Maynard. Um, but she took us over to uh, get Italian ice at Jeremiah's, I think is what it was, it's called. And I thought my head was going to explode. I had the, 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 the worst, what do you call it, the ice cream headache that you could ever have. And I tried all those tricks that they said would work. You stick your thumb in on your mouth. That didn't work. So if I kind of squint a little bit, it's still the effects of that, that really good ice, uh, Italian ice that I had earlier. <clears throat> Hope that you keep us in your prayers as we travel home tomorrow. We'll be flying out sometime tomorrow evening. Uh, if the plane goes out when it's supposed to, it'll be around 7.30 in the evening. So uh, we're uh, we are, but we have had a great weekend. My whole family has really enjoyed it. And, we, and honest, we mean that sincerely, that we have really enjoyed uh, you all and are so grateful to you for it, having us down to be with you. You know, there are some people today that have a problem with understanding forgiveness. And there's some reasons why that they kind of have a difficulty understanding forgiveness one of those reasons is they believe that they what they've done in the past is too bad that God would never forgive that which they have done in the past sometimes they just don't understand what forgiveness is all about and how that God forgives you know there's a there's if you look through the scriptures you see people that have done some really bad things that God has forgiven them for those terrible things there was a man in the Old Testament who murdered and committed adultery. And we know him, and he was called 
A man after God's own heart. And that was King David. He was forgiven. We look into the New Testament and we see one of the mighty apostles of Christ denying Jesus three times. And Jesus forgave him. We find the apostle Paul who took people out of their homes, drug them out of their homes, put them into prisons, put them into jail, sentenced them unto death, and in one case stood by and watched as a Christian was stoned to death, and that was Stephen. But yet, God forgave him. In fact, we find that God washed his sins away. In Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, when Paul was talking, re- retalking about his conversion story, he said, There, and why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All those bad things that he had done were washed away. But we do have difficulties understanding forgiveness. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open up to Luke chapter 15. Oh, you'll know this, this parable right away. In fact, the, what, the great reading that was just done by our young man, the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son. There's three parables in chapter 15. We have the lost sheep and then the lost coin and then the lost son. And I want to focus in on the lost Son, and I want to talk about some things and kind of share some ideas and maybe some things you haven't thought of or that maybe you've forgotten about or maybe you do remember and it can kind of encourage you to go and help other people. But when we get down to this parable in verse 11, it talks about a certain man had two sons. He had a younger son and he had an older son. Well, the younger son came and he said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there with wasted his possessions with prodigal living. That word prodigal means reckless or wasteful living. But when he has spent all there, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of, of that country, and He set him into the fields, or sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. And so you see up to this point, I mean, he is at the lowest point in his life. And Jesus is portraying this. He's talking to these Pharisees. He's talking to the others that are gathered together with with these parables. And he uses this idea of swine to, and that was something that the Jews, they didn't even touch. They didn't get around pigs. That was, that was an unclean animal. And so this is talking about someone that is at the lowest point of their life that they can't even get food from a pig. And he goes on and it says in verse 17, but he, this young man, came to himself. He realized finally where, his, where he was, and now he's going to realize where he needs to be. Now, there are many times that we all have, if we look back in your life, you can see where you were at a low point in your life, and you came to yourself, you came to your senses, and realized that you needed to go to someone, and that someone was God. And this is what we see here. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's kind of practicing his repentance speech. But now we get into the part of the lesson that opens up this idea of what forgiveness is all about. In verse number 20, And he arose and came to his father, But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. I'm going to stop right there. The son is a great distance away, the passage says. Jesus says in this parable. But the father saw him from that great distance away. Why? Was it just by chance he was out working in the field and just happened to look up and there was son? Or maybe he walked out of the house and all of a sudden whoop, there was a son? No, I believe that the father was constantly looking down the road 
every day, looking at the horizon, hoping that his son would come up over the horizon and come back. And what Jesus does here is Jesus is painting for us a visual picture of how God cares for us. He wants us to come to Him. If we have walked away from Him, if we have strayed from Him, He looks down the road and He hopes that He sees us coming up over the horizon to come back to Him. How do we know how much compassion or love He has? Well, we find this in this passage. He goes on and he says in verse 20, But when he saw him a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And how do, what type of compassion? It says, And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now the son hasn't even gotten the words of repentance out yet, has he? He had, I mean, this planned repentance speech, he hasn't gotten anything, he hasn't said anything, and the Father has already seen him and already now has run to him because of the compassion. Studying this idea about Jewish fathers, fathers in this day and age, they didn't run to anybody. Jewish fathers were kind of very stubborn, and if you... If you um, you did this to the family, then they would just kind of stand back and they would wait for you to come crawling on your hands and knees. I mean, if you dishonored the family name, you had to come begging for forgiveness. And we see that Jesus is saying, this is a whole new picture. This is not what you're used to. This is who God is. He will run to you. Because he already knew, he knows your heart, he knows you're coming to him. And this has got to, at this point, the Pharisees, the other Jews that are standing there, they're already, they're, their mind is already kind of mixed up here. They don't understand what's going on. Jesus has changed everything that they've thought of about how family and how everything works, especially with God. And so they turn this around, Jesus does, to help them understand true forgiveness. He loves us. He not only he, does He look for us, and when we're coming back, He runs to us, but He loves us. Again, the very end of that passage, and He fell on His neck and kissed Him. Again, this is still before the repentance speech. This is still before the time that the Son has had, hasn't had any time to say a word. And already the Father's right there. That's how much compassion God has for us if we sin if we make a mistake and we will as a Christian no one here no one ever is perfect there was one perfect person and he lived 2,000 years ago we're not perfect in fact John writes in first in the first chapter of first John that if we say that we don't sin we make God a liar because God says that we do sin we fall short Romans 3.23, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. So none of us are immune to it. Each one of us will sin. And hopefully we should realize and understand that God loves us enough and He will forgive us. Now we look in verse 21. All of this has happened even before, as I said, the repentance... But God does listen to us. We still have to repent. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. That was his repentance. We find in 1 John 1 verse 9, it says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's God. All sin. God doesn't, or the Bible doesn't say about God that He will forgive some of our sins or He will cleanse us from most of our unrighteousness. It says that He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, of course, we have to be in Christ. This doesn't happen outside of Christ. This happens in Christ once, those are, once we are a Christian. And we'll talk about that toward the end. 
But he does listen to us. And then he forgives us. Back to Luke 15 and verse 23. Or verse 22, excuse me. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. And they began to be merry. There's four things that we can see in this, this section here about how that God forgives and how that this father forgave this son. First of all, the robe. What was the purpose of the robe? Well, number one, this son, he was not very clean, was he? I mean, he was rolling around in the pigs wanting to get something to eat with them, and I don't think that you can come up out of a pigsty smelling very good or looking very good. Maybe you can. I remember when I was real little, we lived on a farm for a little while. We rented a house, and the farmer let us use a pig stall to raise some pigs so we could eat those pigs. And I would go out there, and I would ride those pigs. And I was a much smaller, not, not a few years ago. or I mean, I was a little. I was a little. There was a time I was a little. And I would ride those pigs, and I would fall off into the mud and all the other stuff that was, that was there. And I would get back up and I'd laugh and I'd jump back on the pig and ride it again. And my mom would say, you cannot come into this house until you hose yourself off. I, you must be clean before you can come back in this house. The father, what he does is, the father has the garments of cleanth, clean, that are clean. That are clean garments that we don't have. And only the Father has the clean garments. And so this first, this robe, is, it restores his identity. The identity of this son. Well, what about the ring? Well, the ring restores his authority in the family. It restores him as a son. He doesn't place him as a servant. That's what the son wanted. He wanted to come back and say, look, just give me... Just kind of put me off in maybe the shack over here off to the side, and I'll work for you. No, he says, I'm going to restore you completely. And he restores his authority as a son. The sandals. Sandals here, it, it means, I think, the idea of restores his ability. Gives him more ability. Most of those that would work during this day and age did not have shoes. And this would be a sign of that his, again, of his restoration to the family. And finally, the, the fatted calf, this is restoring his security. He now has something to eat. With all of this, we say the very end, and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. They celebrated. And there, when one comes back to Christ, there is great celebration of that restoration. And listen, tonight... When we get to the end of the lesson and we offer the invitation to you and we're singing that song and you know that there's things on your, in your life that you need to ask God for forgiveness for, go to God in prayer and ask for forgiveness. Because he's looking down the road for you. If you've left him, if you walked away from him, he's looking down to the road and he's looking at the horizon and he's hoping to see you come up over the horizon. And he will run to you he will show compassion and love for you and he will restore you once you ask for forgiveness. Remember I said a little while ago that all this is done in Christ, not outside of Christ? Well, we look back at the scriptures to see how we get into Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news, the glad tidings. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 tells us that that good news is the death of Jesus on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the good news. That's what we go out and proclaim to the world, to the lost, and to the dying. Friends, brethren, there are over 7 billion people in the world. There are are thousands upon thousands of people in this area alone that are lost and they are dying in their sins. And if they don't come to Christ before they die, they will be lost eternally. And that's tough. That's hard to think about that all these people are going to be lost. Jesus says that there are a lot of people on the wide road that leads to destruction. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. And that there is a narrow road that which leads to life, but only few find it. Compared to all the people that are in the Jacksonville, Orange Park area, we are but the few. Very few. And so we've got a lot of work to do. you got a lot of work even in your own neighborhood. Jesus said, go into all the world. Go into your world, wherever that is. You don't have to go off into Russia or, or China or some other country necessarily. If you can, if you have opportunities to do that, that's wonderful. That's great. It's, one, it's, a, it's in fact, a great blessing to be able to go on a mission trip somewhere. And I know many of you have done that. And you've been blessed. But you can even go in your own neighborhood. That's a great mission field as well. Because you've got a lot of neighbors and people around you that aren't members. And that God wants you to spread the message. God wants us. That's why Jesus commanded us to go. It was, was not a suggestion to go. Jesus wasn't saying, well, if you get time, maybe if you drop by, you just kind of maybe say a little no. No, he said, go. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he says, go, into all the, go, into, and go and make disciples to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you at and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But go and tell and sow the seed. After that, it's on the hearer to respond. And if they respond to it, that's wonderful. They first of all, in their response, they must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They must believe that he died, was buried, and he rose again victorious. And they've got to believe with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then they need to change. They've got to turn things around. They've got to repent of their past. That is, they've got to die to the old way of living. Separate themselves from the world. You know, they're in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. It says, men and brethren, what shall we do? They believed at that point. What else is there? Peter said, Repent. Change. Come up out of the world. Turn things around. Go in the opposite direction. Don't do the things that you were doing before. And then go into the watery grave of baptism. If you've not done these things, why not? What's holding you back from becoming a Christian? What obstacle is in the way? Is there an obstacle in your way? Is there something in your path that it, tonight that we can help you with? Maybe that we can remove completely. Just to, to get out of the way so that you can come to Jesus. If that is the case, we want to help you with that. We want to help you remove whatever that obstacle is so that you can see Christ clearly and come to Him and obey the gospel. If you've obeyed the gospel, but you've drifted back into this world... God stands waiting for you to come back. That's how much he loves you. Every single person. You might think, well, how does he love me? I mean, there's 7 billion people in the world. You got, you've got the, all these others that are doing John 3:16. Remember that one? For God so loved everybody but you. Is that what it says? No, it says, for God so loved the whole world. The whole world. The 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves us all. And he wants you to come back to him. He looks for you. He waits for you. If you have a need tonight, please, we're begging you, do not leave tonight outside of Christ. Do not leave lost. Please. This might be your last and only opportunity to ask for forgiveness. This might be your only opportunity to obey the gospel. You might not have another. What does James say about life? It is but a vapor, appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. Life could end just like that. Jesus could return tonight. He said that he could return at any moment. And we've always got to be ready and prepared. Read Matthew chapter 25. But we're going to sing this invitation song, the one that was announced just a moment ago, to give you an opportunity to make things right with God. If it is that you're not a Christian, to become one. We'll take your confession and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, just like Philip asked the Ethiopian eunuch, if you believe, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they both went down in the water and he baptized him. We'll take him to that water. We'll baptize you. God will take away your sins. Wash them away with the blood of the Lamb. And we'll raise you up out of that water grave, a new creation. Everything that you did yesterday and before, washed away. And you'll be pure and clean. If you are a Christian, yet the world you've allowed to come back into your heart and into your life, Jesus, God, they wait for you as well to come to him. If it's between you and God and you and God alone, go to God in prayer right now, even before we start singing, and ask for forgiveness, and God will forgive you. Maybe it's a public sin that you need to ask for forgiveness publicly. We're here to help you. The elders will be here. Caleb will be here to help you, and to, they'll pray with you, and they'll pray for you. Maybe it's just something that's just weighing you down, and you just can't seem to handle it anymore, and you need a lot more prayers. Hey, we're, we love you that much. We're here to pray with you and to help you get back on the right road toward heaven. Whatever the case is, please, please don't leave outside of him, but come, and together we stand and as we sing.